In this series, I'm building a Commodore 64 from EEPROMs, Static RAM, and TTL Logic, so we can explore the intricate details of how this machine worked. I had a Commodore 64 in my teenage years, so this project is really scratching a major itch I've had since then. I'm doing it as a trilogy of trilogies, otherwise it'd just go on forever. Trilogy 1 is about the CPU and the raster generator, which are now nearly complete. This trilogy is about the sprite system, and in this episode, episode 4, we'll be looking at the sprite engine. I refer to each trilogy as an epic, and the third epic is about sound and the SID chip. This is the basic hardware that scans out the pixels within the sprite, and I'll eventually need to replicate it 8 times. Now, I'm building this as I go, not just documenting a completed project, so please feel free to leave comments about suggestions and improvements I might incorporate into the design. Sprites are how the Commodore 64 brought games to life. Hardware accelerated graphics straight from the video chip, but how do they actually work? This is a sprite engine I've built entirely from TTL chips. To my knowledge, it's the only Commodore compatible one on YouTube. Now, this isn't the most practical way to build a sprite system, but hopefully, it's one of the clearest ways to understand what's going on under the hood. We'll walk through the architecture, timing, and design decisions, so by the end, you'll know exactly how sprites are fetched, masked, and drawn by this TTL build. A sprite, or as the Vic2 datasheet charmingly calls it, a movable image block, what a god-awful name, is just a 2D patch of graphics drawn by the video controller, not the CPU. The CPU only tells the video chip which sprites to draw and where. A tiny computational overhead. The VIC-2 in the Commodore 64 can handle 8 sprites per scanline, but here's the killer feature that left other systems behind. The video system can detect collision between sprites and automatically interrupt the CPU when this occurs. Think Pac-Man touching a ghost. The CPU doesn't have to waste time checking pixel by pixel, it just gets notified. It also detects sprite to background collisions, like Pac-Man eating a dot. Again, no bit banging required, just another interrupt. Now, there are plenty of videos to show how to program sprites on the Commodore 64, but that's not what we're doing here. I've built a sprite engine from TTL Logic. The goal isn't practicality, it's to understand, from first principles, how sprites really work. But, to recreate it, we need to understand how the VIC-2 chip handles sprites. Each sprite is basically a 24 by 21 pixel bitmap at 1 bit per pixel. A 0 means transparent, and 1 means visible. And its colour is set by the sprite's colour register. Sprite 0 uses a register located at D027, for example. There are a few different display modes. Standard bitmap's the easiest. 1 bit per pixel, no stretching. Double height mode is simple enough, just stretch vertically. No extra hardware required. Double width mode is trickier, and we'll need a bit of extra hardware. Multicolor mode is the annoying one. Pixels are grouped up into pairs, so you get four colors, well, three plus transparency, and you lose X resolution. Sprites become 12 by 21 pixels, and each pixel is stretched horizontally. Multicolor double width mode gets painful, but we'll tackle that later. So, why are sprites 21 pixels high? Seems like a strange number for computer hardware. Well, each sprite's 24 pixels wide at 1 bit per pixel. That's 3 bytes per row. Multiply that by 21 scan lines, and you get 63 bytes, which fits almost perfectly into a 64 byte memory block. That's no accident. Let's break down how and where sprite bitmap data is stored. Sprites must begin on a 64 byte boundary, so within any 256 page on the 6510, a sprite can start at 0, 40, 80, or C0 hex, not at a random offset like 5C hex. In theory, with 64 kilobytes of RAM, you could store 1024 different sprites, but the VIC-2 chip can't access the full 64K. It's limited to a 16 kilobyte window, usually somewhere between 0 and 3FFS. The location of this 16 kilobyte window is controlled by the CIA chip at address DD00, specifically port A, bit 0 and 1. They set the top two bits to the VIX address space, so now we know where bits 14 and 15 of the sprite address come from. 
What about bits 6 through 13? Let's call this the sprite index. Here's the clever bit. Those eight sprite indices are actually stored inside the screen character buffer. The screen's 40 by 25 characters. That's 1,000 bytes. But if we reserve a full one kilobyte block for the screen, there are 24 spare bytes. The VIG chip uses the last eight of those, locations 1016 to 1023, to hold the sprite indices for sprites 0 through 7. Now, I can't say this for certain, but I'd bet a penny to a pound that the VIC 2 chip uses shift registers, one per sprite, to clock out each pixel at the dot clock rate. That would mean eight shift registers running in parallel during a scan line. Here's a general idea of what happens on each scan line. Before the active part of the scan line, during horizontal blanking, the VIC 2 chip checks which sprites might appear. It reads all eight sprite indices, regardless of whether the sprites are visible. Then it calculates the current scan line within each sprite and fetches three bytes of bitmap data, offset by the sprite's vertical position. For example, if we're on a scan line 10 within a sprite, the VIC chip needs to fetch bytes 30, 31, and 32. So, for all eight sprites, that's eight indices plus three bytes each, 32 bytes total. But there's a bandwidth problem. A normal scan line only has enough time to fetch 40 bytes of text, 5 refresh cycles, and just 18 spare cycles for everything else. What if all 8 sprites are active? That's too much to fit. So the VIC-2 chip does what it always does under pressure. It's still CPU cycles. During the VIXS phase of the CPU cycle, when the CPU clock's low, it'll fetch the sprite index, fetch the first byte of bitmap data, then, assert ready to pause the CPU and use two more cycles, normally reserved for the CPU, to fetch the remaining two bytes. But remember, the 6510 can't stop on a dime. It might need to finish up to three write cycles before halting. So, even if only sprites 0, 2, 4, 6 and 7 are visible, the VIC-2 chip might end up pausing the CPU for the full 16 clock cycles. Whereas if the visible sprites were 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is 5 in Keitel, we might only need 10 cycles. It all depends on how the active sprites are spaced out. OK, now that we understand how the VIC-2 chip handles sprites, let's talk about how I'm going to recreate it, which is probably what you actually came here to see. I'm building a dedicated hardware module called a sprite engine. There'll be one per sprite, so I'll need eight of them. I'm starting with two hand-wired prototypes, built using point-to-point -point wiring. Once I'm confident with the design, I'll fabricate a PCB and duplicate it for the remaining six. So, what does a sprite engine actually do? Its job is to scan out raw pixel data at exactly the right moment during a scan line. But to do that, it needs access to the sprite bitmap data. And here's the challenge. That data is stored in the CPU main memory static RAM. But in my build, the sprite controller doesn't read it directly. To solve this, I'm going to use a shadow memory, just like I did for the text system in the raster generator. This means every write the CPU makes to sprite memory is captured and stored in another static RAM dedicated to the sprite system. Yes, this means the RAM is now triplicated, once for the CPU, once for the raster generator, and once more for the sprite engine. But I'm not optimizing for cost, I'm optimizing for clarity. This build is understanding about how sprites work, I'm not minimizing the part count. Okay, so we've got the sprite data in Shadow RAM. We need a controller to feed the data into the sprite engines on each scan line. That's the job of the sprite microcontroller. It's not a special purpose sprite sequencer, it's not a custom state machine hand wired for this job. So, what does it look like? Well, here's the twist. It's exactly the same hardware used by the CPU. The same finite state machine circuit, same memory, literally the same printed circuit board. In fact, if I temporarily give it full read-write access to the shadow RAM, I can boot Apple II Pac-Man on it. And that's the deeper message of this project. At the heart of the sprite controller, at the heart of the CPU, at the heart of the Commodore 64, it's just a finite state machine and some memory. That's it. You can build it out of TTL, you can build it out of EEPROMs, you can simulate it in software, but the core idea never changes. 
So from here on out, we'll dive into the Sprite Engine hardware. Hopefully that gives you more reason to take the rule book and notepad idea seriously. It's not just a teaching tool, it's a core set of principles. All right, back to the hardware. Let's start with the simplest case, a standard 24 by 21 pixel Sprite in bitmap mode. We'll call this Sprite Zero, but remember, this same design gets replicated eight times, once for each potential Sprite in a scan line. In each scan line, we need to load three bytes, or 24 bits of pixel data into the Sprite engine. We'll store these in three octal D type flip-flops, one for each byte. We'll come back to how the data gets there in a moment. Now, I'm targeting a standard VGA output, which uses 525 scan lines, not 262 like NTSC. So, each Commodore 64 scan line spans two VGA scan lines. That means, once we've loaded those 24 bits, they need to stay valid across two VGA scan lines. To keep this data valid for two scan lines, I need to copy it into a second set of registers, which is updated every other horizontal sync signal. I call these registers the back buffer and the front buffer. The concept's similar to double buffering in computer graphics, where the CPU is free to manipulate the back buffer at will, while the front buffer is ready for display on the screen. In this case, though, each buffer is only three 8-bit registers. To actually draw the pixels, I need to serialize them, one bit per pixel. For that, I'm going to use the 74HC166 shift register, the same part I use for the text raster generator. But here's the catch. The 166 is only 8 bits wide. So, how do we shift out 24 bits? Simple. We cascade three of them. Each 74HC166 has a serial input pin, pin 1, and a QH output on the far right. If we connect the QH output of one chip to the serial input of the next, we get a 16-bit shift register. Then, 24 bits. The chip's designed to be extended like this. But here's the key difference from the text generator. In text mode, the shift register is reloaded every 8 pixels. In sprite mode, it's loaded once per scan line. That means each sprite can only appear once per scan line, and only for 24 contiguous pixels. The rest of the time, the shift register just outputs zeros. Uh, that's an important point and worth pausing on. So to summarize, here's how the system works. We have a back buffer which the sprite controller can write to at any time. Then, at the end of every second VGA scan line, which is equivalent to every single Commodore 64 scan line, the data is copied from the back buffer into the front buffer on horizontal sync. Finally, at the exact screen pixel where the sprite starts, the data is copied from the front register into the shift register, serialized, and sent to the display. At all other times, the shift register should be outputting a zero. Now, you might be wondering, how do we position that 24 pixel burst anywhere on a scan line? That's where the X position logic comes in. We use three 74HC161 4 bit presetable counters cascaded together to form a 12 bit counter. These are clocked at the pixel rate, and they count up during the scan line. But instead of starting at zero, we preload them with a negative offset using two's complement. Let's say we want the sprite to appear 200 pixels after horizontal sync. We preload the counter with minus 200, which is F38 in 12-bit two's complement hexadecimal form. Then the counter increments F39, F3A, F3B, and so on. In pixel 199 of the screen relative to the H sync signal, the counter will contain FFF, which is minus 1. That triggers the terminal count output signal, a one cycle pulse. We invert that pulse and feed it into the load signal on all the 74HC166s. As we clock from 199 to 200, the counter goes to 0. Pixel data will be loaded into the shift register, and the top bit will be displayed immediately. And right there, boom, we've loaded 24 bits into the shift register. From that point on, the counter just keeps ticking, and the shift register clocks out one bit per pixel. This is how we serialize the 24 bits of sprite data on a given pair of VGA scan lines. After 24 bits, it just outputs zeros. That's how we get the sprite to appear exactly where we want in a scan line. Now, 
Why not use the active signal instead of H-Sync to trigger this load into the counter? Basically because we need to support sprites that appear partially in the left border. Commodore 64 sprites actually start 24 pixels into the left border of the screen, so this negative offset system gives us fine grain horizontal positioning. We'll cover how I translate the VIC-2 sprite X coordinate into this counter preload value in the next video. We have another problem. The sprite controller can't load values into the X counter during a scan line, because, well, it's busy counting. We need some more registers, which I call the X position registers, to hold the values before they're needed. I think I can get away without double buffering these values but it will restrict when the sprite controller can write into the exposition registers. More on that in the next video. So, how does the data we want get into the exposition registers and the back buffer registers? All these registers are updated by the sprite microcontroller over a shared 8-bit data bus. A 74HC138 decoder selects which register gets written. Now, there's one final twist, and that's about multicolor mode. In that mode, I need to output two pixels at a time, which means I need to shift out two bits every other pixel. I've restructured the single 24-bit sprite shift register into two 12-bit shift registers, which receive alternating bits. Even numbered bits go into the top shift register, and non-numbered bits go into the bottom shift register. This lets me do what I want, simultaneously scan out two adjacent bits every other dot clock. Same bandwidth, but now the pixels are in a form I can use either for monochrome sprites or multicolor sprites. Some external logic, yet to be built, decides whether to display these two bits as two single monochrome pixels or as one double wide multicolor pixel. This board includes a second raster generator with its own clock source. Eventually, I'll use the shared signals from the main text raster generator, but for now, Having a second raster generator makes debugging a lot easier. I'll probably leave it in for testing, but technically, I can remove it once everything's working. Okay, let's see if we can correlate the schematic with the actual sprite engine build. Two 12-bit shift registers. Front buffer. Back buffer. X counter. X position register and then the 74HC138 for selecting a register to write to. Okay, we already know that the sprite controller is working as a random access Turing machine. Now, I've hooked up the raster generator and connected the active bit to the RGB lines of the VGA port, so that's what I'm expecting. To display an actual sprite though, I'm going to need to program the state machines in the sprite controller, which looks a lot like microprogramming. So, join me in the next episode where we'll try to get some sprites on the screen.